please, arri uh, please rise for the arrival of the official party and remain standing for the national anthem and the invocation. Officer Training Command Newport, arriving. <laughs> Naval Chaplaincy School and Center, arriving. Ladies and gentlemen, our national anthem. Ladies and gentlemen, Chaplain Butts will now offer the invocation. Let us pray. Eternal Father, we come before you thankful for this day that we can gather together to celebrate with each of these officers on this momentous occasion. For five weeks, they drank from the fountain of instruction passed along by their dedicated class officers and RDCs. They spent long hours drilling, doing physical exercises, and learning about what it means to be a naval officer. They spent time building friendships that for some will last a lifetime. May they take all of this knowledge and experiences out to the fleet, positively impacting those they will serve. We recognize the sacrifice and dedication they've given in choosing to serve our country. A new adventure awaits as they leave here to work in their respective fields of service to the men and women in the fleet. Be with each of them in the challenges of a PCS move, wherever their orders take them. I pray, O oh God, that their lives be guided by your light and our Navy values and attributes of integrity, accountability, honor, courage, and commitment. Keep each of them and their families in a loving care and protection throughout the coming days and forever. Amen. Ladies and gentlemen, please be seated. Ladies and gentlemen, Captain Mark Hazenberg, Commanding Officer, Officer Training Command, Newport.
distinguished visitors, officer training command staff, family and friends joining us today both in person and virtually, and shipmates of Officer Development School Class 21080. Good morning. It is an absolute honor and joy for me to have this opportunity to welcome this class into one of the most prestigious, challenging, and rewarding careers in our nation, that of a Naval officer. Today, my staff and I will bear witness as class 21080 renews a solemn promise to our nation, reaffirming their oath to support and defend the Constitution of the United States as professional Naval officers. For the families joining us, I want to both thank you and commend you for the performance of your sons, your daughters, husbands, wives, brothers, and sisters. Your love, support, and personal standards have produced the quality individuals seated here. Ones who not only chose vocations that helped their fellow human beings, but who chose a path of service to their fellow citizens. I can think of no finer group to go forth into the fleet than the officers seated here today. They could not have gotten to this point without the careful guidance and support of family. On behalf of the Navy and a grateful nation, please accept my most sincere thank you and well done. To the class, I am proud of you and all that you have accomplished while here. As you depart here for your schools and duty stations, remember your oath you carry. To paraphrase Joseph Conrad's discussion of command at sea, there are far more obligations than privileges. You are about to be placed in a position to lead and mentor what are truly one of our most valuable national products, the enlisted men and women of our Navy. Those that volunteer to serve are a precious national resource, so you must always treat them as such. You must view well and faithfully discharging your duties as a sacred responsibility, much as your outstanding class team here has felt that obligation to you. The foundations we have laid here at ODS are solid. It is now up to you to build upon this as you enter the Naval Service. For Class 21080, I am very impressed with the effort you have expended over the last several weeks. I want to thank you for all that you have done and will do in the service of this great nation of ours. It is my pleasure and distinct honor to welcome you to the wardroom as professional Naval officers in the world's finest Navy. It is my honor and privilege this morning to introduce to you our guest speaker, Captain Kerry Cash, Commanding Officer of Naval Chaplaincy School and Center. A graduate of the Citadel with a Bachelor's of Arts degree in Political Science, he answered the call to ministry, earning a Master's degree of Divinity uh, from Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary. He also completed a Master of Theology with a concentration in Ethics from Boston University and a Doctor of Ministry from the Catholic University of America. His operational tours include serving with the 1st Battalion, 5th Marine Regiment during the opening months of Operation Iraqi Freedom. He has served at sea on, a, on afloat units to include USS San Jacinto, uh, CG-56, and USS John C. Stennis, CVN-74. He most recently served as a Force and Fleet Chaplain for NAFSENT U.S. Fifth Fleet in Bahrain, where he was responsible for coordinating religious ministry for all Navy chaplains afloat and ashore serving in the U.S. Central Command's area of responsibility. As a commanding officer of Naval Chaplaincy School, his team is dedicated to train, develop, and inspire chaplains and religious program specialists to pursue excellence as they strengthen the soul of the warfighter, the family, and the fleet. His leadership is absolutely essential to the continued success of the world's greatest Navy, and we are truly fortunate to have him here with us today to share his thoughts. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming our guest of honor today, Captain Kerry Cat. Thank you, Captain Hazenberg. Good morning. Well, thank you so much for the honor of allowing me to participate in this graduation and what is a significant milestone and launching point in your life and naval career. Uh, as a fellow staff officer, I welcome you uh, to the Staff Corps and I applaud you and your decision uh, to take this life that God has given you and use it to be of service to something greater. Congratulations. 
Let me begin with an illustration. My oldest daughter is 23 years old. Her name is Phoebe. When she was four years old, our family lived in Camp Pendleton where I was stationed with Marines. On a particular day, I was in the kitchen working and I suddenly was alarmed by the sound of Phoebe screaming from our backyard. Parents soon learn how to discern whether their child's cry is one of genuine distress or a cry to get attention. This was genuine distress. I turned to run out of the back door and just as I crossed the threshold of my patio, I stopped and laughed. There was my little girl hanging from a branch of a tree, holding on for dear life. What she did not know and what I could clearly see was that her feet were only two inches from the ground. And so I said to her as gently as I could, Phoebe, if you will trust daddy and stretch out your toes, you will feel the solid ground underneath your feet. After weighing my advice, she stretched out her toes, felt the ground, dropped down, and off she ran to play. I turned around to go into my house, and as I crossed back over the threshold of the patio, I had a realization. Isn't this like life? We find ourselves in a situation or crisis where we feel like we are barely hanging on, but if we will just stretch out or reach out, we will find that there is a firm foundation beneath us, solid ground. In my faith tradition, that's the love of God and the promise that underneath us are the everlasting arms. Perhaps this foundation is different for you, but we can all agree that foundations are important. I want to take just one moment and speak to all of you who are about to graduate about the importance of foundations in your life as you get set to launch into greater service. A foundation we all know is something that is firm. It is reliable and trustworthy. In a sense, it is immovable. It's something that's laid at the very bedrock of our lives without which we cannot build anything of any structural integrity. Now, I recognize that you've all built foundations of one kind or another or you would not be here. You've demonstrated a level of commitment and success in your life and career that implies strength and resilience. But it is equally true that with the passing of time and the acceptance of greater responsibilities, these foundations can suffer neglect or go unattended. With greater demands placed upon us, there is a greater capacity to let what's most important fall into disrepair. And this is key to remember as you embark on a naval career. I think of the story of Naaman, the military general from ancient times. Naaman was an extraordinary leader, one whom his soldiers aspired to emulate in every way. Naaman could boast of many achievements, accomplishments, innovations, and victories in battle. He wore, like some of you, decorations and accolades upon his chest, demonstrating experience and stature as a leader. By every societal and institutional measurement, Naaman had arrived and lived a kind of desirable life. But for all of his outward success, Naaman had a secret of which few were aware. Underneath his armor, Naaman was dying of leprosy. He was a leper. While his armor was shiny and impeccable, while his standing in the eyes of those he led was secure, a corrosive disease was eating him away. This is a metaphor for the dangers inherent in leadership. As you gain greater responsibilities as officers, as you master greater skills and the management of people, you and I can become masters of neglect and allow our personal lives and deeper foundations to suffer erosion or waste away. Even now, by your decisions, you're either building foundations or you are neglecting them, a failure that sooner or later will become evident to all, for what a man does in secret will one day be proclaimed from the rooftops. Which is why the writer of Proverbs says, watch your heart with all diligence, for from it flow the issues of life. So what can we do? Let me suggest one foundation that you can build upon that will make all the difference. Faithful friends. 
By faithful friends, I'm not necessarily talking about drinking buddies or acquaintances. I'm talking about the highest form of friendships, what Aristotle called friendships based on virtue. A virtuous friend is someone who desires your moral and spiritual best, which is to say they are willing to listen to you and speak truthfully to you. Friends like these are crucial and in fact are the chief way we overcome the dangers of compartmentalization. Our psychologists here can tell us compartmentalization is the ability to separate conflicting thoughts or experiences to avoid the discomfort of contradiction. It's not inherently negative. In fact, we do this daily. While studies suggest men compartmentalize more than women, the bottom line is if you are a naval leader, man or woman, you compartmentalize and you do it quite well. You've already built compartments of career, marriage, hobbies, personal projects, success, children, conflict, and unresolved issues, and we have to do this. However, while compartmentalization is, an, is a necessity, it can also be our undoing if we're not working to integrate these compartments and deal with unresolved issues. And that is where virtuous friends come in. My first assignment was with U.S. Marines in Iraq in 2003. We had two men killed in action and about 70 casualties, almost all of which came from, from one rifle company. You might know a Marine rifle company then consisted of about 120 men led by a Marine Corps captain or company commander. And I watched this captain who lost two of his men, one being a gunny and one being a first lieutenant. I watched him fearlessly lead his men with courage and resolve during these losses and he compartmentalized. He had to. We were on the move every day and did not have time to grieve or process what had happened. Toward the end of our deployment, our battalion took a pause in a southern Iraq city where we were relatively safe and able to rest. We set up in an old abandoned building and I found a room which functioned as my office. <clears throat> One day the company commander knocked on my door and asked if I had a minute. I invited him in and turned to go take a seat where we could talk together. However, when the door closed, he remained standing in all of his gear, so I stood there with him. And as soon as that door had closed, this big strapping Marine officer, for about two minutes, lost it. Tears flowed as the losses he'd experienced overwhelmed his emotions. He didn't say a word, and neither did I. And after about two minutes, he dried his eyes and he said, thanks, chaps. And out he went out to, to lead his Marines. You and I may not be in a combat situation like that, Captain. Some of you may. But you will be in a world of stress and crisis at times. And like that, Captain, you will have to compartmentalize and keep it together for your people. It is your duty. But also like that, Captain, from time to time, you as officers need to be able to knock on a door with someone you trust and deal with the issues. For him, it was grief and sadness, but it could be a whole range of issues that you're facing. Stress, anger, a moral failure, a dilemma, confusion, a family crisis. The challenge is that as you get more senior as an officer, the fewer people there are to whom you can go. Thus, it is crucial you take this step now. Resilience is not just about fighting through the issues, but occasionally opening doors and inviting others in. It could be a chaplain, a religious leader, a counselor, a pastor, a friend, a spouse, a mentor, whoever it is, it should be someone you trust, whose life is not in ruins, who will give you only advice that endorses their own bad decisions, and someone with whom you are not in competition. The ancient Greek said, two, see together what one would miss. The Proverbs teach us as iron sharpens iron, so does one man sharpen another, and in the abundance of counselors, there is victory. I am proud of each one of you, I congratulate you all on this significant moment in your life, and I pray that you would know the many victories that come 
not only from mission accomplishment and a job well done, but the victory that comes from seeking good, faithful advice from good, faithful, truth-telling friends. This kind of friendship is rare, but it is firm ground upon which to build. My faith tradition says that to build upon what's firm is to be wise. For the rains will come, the floodwaters rise, and the winds will blow. But they who build their house on a rock will never fall. Congratulations. God bless you all. Thank you. Thank you, Captain Hazenberg and Captain Cash. At the conclusion of each ODS class, several students are recognized by their fellow classmates as well as OTCN staff for outstanding achievement during the five-week course of instruction. Lieutenant Jackson, front and center. The Honor Student Award is presented to the officer who best demonstrates an overall excellence in the areas of academics, physical fitness, and military bearing, consistently setting the example for his or her peers throughout the many challenges faced at Officer Training Command Newport. The Honor Student Award goes to Lieutenant Jackson. Ensign Mackay, front and center. The Alfred Award is given to the officer who achieves the highest military grade derived from personnel inspections, room inspections, and general military bearing. This award is named for the Continental Sloop of War, the Alfred. Commissioned in 1775, the Alfred served as the flagship of native Rhode Islander Commodore Essex Hopkins, serving as a role model of Navy pride and professionalism, maintaining the highest of military standards and providing inspiration to all. The Alfred Award goes to Ensign Mackay. <laughs> Ensign Lindsay, front and center. The Captain George Townsend Smith Leadership Award is presented to the officer who personifies the highest standards of personal example, good leadership practices, and moral responsibility. Officers were nominated by their peers and selected by the Officer Training Command staff. The Captain George Townsend Smith Leadership Award goes to Ensign Lindsay. Ensign Jeffrey, front and center. The Edie Award, named for Lieutenant Thomas Edie, United States Navy, recognizes the highest achievement in academic and military achieve, uh, performance. Lieutenant Thomas Edie, who immigrated from Scotland and settled in Rhode Island, was awarded the Navy Cross and the Medal of Honor for his courageous efforts as a diver during the salvage of submarines SS-4 and SS-51 off the coast of Massachusetts. 
He was a member of the Southeastern New England chapter of the Retired Officers Association at the time of his death in 1974. In recognition of this accomplishment, in addition to the Certificate of Achievement, the Military Officers Association of America has also provided a three-year membership to the Edie Award winner, Ensign Jeffrey. For the past five weeks, the company Guidon has been symbol a symbol of spirit, dedication, teamwork, and unit identity. To symbolize the fact that these officers seated before you have completed their training, they will return the Guidon to their class chief petty officers, Senior Chief Gas Turbine System Technician Juan Rosa and Aviation Ordnance Men Chief Lachanda Parker. Lieutenant Ayazalo will now deliver the reaffirmation of the oath of office. Would all military personnel in uniform please come to the position of attention. Ladies and gentlemen, the commanding officer of Officer Training Command Newport would like to present to you your newly reaffirmed Naval Officers. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, please rise for the playing of the service songs and the final dismissal.
Officer Development School, Class 21080. Upon graduation from Officer Development School, you are ordered to detach and report to your duty stations, where you will assume your duties and responsibilities by order of Mark Hazenberg, Captain, United States Navy, Commanding Officer, Officer Training Command, Newport. Ladies and gentlemen, this concludes our ceremony. On behalf of the commanding officer, Officer Training Command Newport, thank you for attending today's graduation. Please stay safe, stay healthy, and thank you.